you know, Arunab, uh, I would start uh, with you. I would like to ask you something which, you know, everybody would want to know today that, uh, you know, uh, Uclean is one of the uh, greatest franchise businesses, you know, in recent time, particularly in laundry with uh, your online as well as your offline presence. So, you know, being the, uh, being the founder, it's been a journey of just about three years, you know, a little over than 1,000 days. So what's been the key points uh, in your journey as an entrepreneur? Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Ashita Ma'am and Gaurav sir, for having me on this platform. I started, I learned all my franchising from Franchise India. So, uh, pretty much honored to be here on this platform and now share my own experience about franchising and entrepreneurship. Uh, so, when I talk about uh, the Euclid experience, I think uh, uh, one thing that has been my biggest learning uh, so far is that the business model continues to evolve. So when we started off Euclean in the first place, uh, the idea was, as the name suggests, is that we expected people like they do in Europe and USA to come down to the store and clean the clothes on their own. Uh, but within three months of uh, debuting with our first couple of stores in Delhi and CR, uh, we very quickly realized that uh, Indians still, even today, are not cut out for a do-it-yourself kind of a business. Reason being that labor is cheap, uh, people like to spend a lot of time at their home or people are uh, busy working with their regular jobs. So since labor is cheap, the costing is not very high. People typically want uh, a business to arrange a pick up and drop kind of a service. So within three months of starting Uclean, we realized that if we need to drive this business, if we need to drive unit level profitability, we will have to start offering pick up and drop service. And when you, when you talk about today, we almost have across India, we see that 95% of our business is pickup and drop based, while only 5% is where customers would typically come down to the store. And even in that case, almost uh, out of that, that 5%, 4% would actually just drop off their clothes and go to a nearest salon or go to the nearest gym and then on their way back, pick up the clothes. Only 1% of uh, the people and in very, very uh, exclusive pockets, like in certain pockets of Mumbai or certain pockets of Delhi, where we see that there's a higher penetration of expats. Do we actually see a do-it-yourself kind of a phenomenon? So honestly, I feel that uh, the business model has to evolve depending on uh, the customer reaction. Another interesting example is what we did with Ken Drive. So when we started off, the idea was that we would be a pure play laundry operator, which is a weekly kind of a business where a customer would typically outsource his clothes week after week to you, provided that he's delighted with you. But very soon we realized that the cleaning industry is uh, highly unorganized. So people do not have a lot of trust. The moment we start building trust with these families, with these households, once they started regularly availing our laundry service, they started reaching out to us and requesting us if we can also clean their carpet or if we can also clean their sofa or deep clean their home for that matter. So once we started getting inundated with these requests from across India, we realized that there is a very interesting parallel opportunity, which does not have a frequency as high as laundry, but that also exists, which is surface cleaning. And that's when we decided that we need to do another pivot. We need to start looking at becoming a one-stop shop for all cleaning requirements of a household or a family. And that's when we decided to uh, uh, form a master franchise partnership with Kendra towards the middle of 2019. So I think my biggest learning is that you have to be really open and you have to be really driven by what the customer is demanding. While you could do a lot of paperwork, you could do a lot of market research, but the reality hits you only once you uh, start running on the ground. Yeah, true. Very well said. It has to be a journey. It's not something which is a destination once you start. And absolutely. And I, I completely agree with Arnav. Uh, franchising, what I've seen uh, in my experience has always been uh, evolution. If you continue to hear two things, one to your franchisee and to your customer, and sometimes they can also have a conflict. You know, you know, franchisee tells you very differently sometimes, and what the customer is telling you. So I think it's a very fine balance, uh, which has a organizational lead, because you are essentially working with the channel, and channel has certain different viewpoint on looking at opportunity, and 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 sometimes as a brand owner, you have a very different viewpoint. I mean, it's more more from a uh, you know, goals which are in the channel which you have in a franchisee, the short term, they're looking at two to three years horizon. And as a brand owner, you're looking at a 
10 20 30 year horizon so horizons are very different in terms of how the consumer and priorities can change so it is a it is always about uh, looking at it from two different eyes and 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 then create your own balance uh, that what is the right answer to it and sometimes uh, the answers are not pleasing uh, uh, most of the times i mean and, and you and you have to take final call on the on the consumer because end of the day if the consumer is there in the business then everything else would fill in and sometimes it is very difficult and this is one 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 of questions i would like arun up to uh, really answer is that uh, sometimes it is very difficult sometimes you you addressing a customer for a for a what i call them the bigger cause for the brand and it is not with sometimes very good goes with the channel because they see this is not something which they would like to really address to and things of that nature so how do you really handle that conflict and how do you really see and and it's very important uh, uh, that as i mentioned uh, before we started that uh, there is a lot of learning which uh, i don't know you can give it to a lot of uh, uh, franchise brand owners because sometimes they they don't hear the voice of the customer they 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 hearing from uh, indirect way and so they are not able to make a lot of judgments or they make poor judgments on on businesses and i have personally have uh, you know faced this and even even some cases suffered on that uh, because we were facing uh, we were hearing from an indirect way i mean not hearing from the customer directly so any any remarks you would like to have arunab on that so i think uh, a very valid observation and something that uh, we are confronted with almost on a regular basis uh, so while again this is a process that has again evolved over time for us also but what we have started doing is that uh, we have uh, bundled our franchises because each franchisee in itself is a very different personality so a franchisee sitting in dwarka would be very different from a franchisee sitting in janakpuri in delhi or a franchisee sitting in rg barwa road in guwahati so what we have done is that uh, over uh, basis our experience of uh, collaborating with these franchise partners and working with them very closely uh, we have bundled them into what i would call two categories one is what we call the early adopters so these are the franchise partners uh, who we have seen are more receptive to ideas who are willing to work work more aggressively with customers are willing to try out new experiments so whenever we come across an opportunity where we feel that there could be a potential conflict of interest where certain franchise partners might not like the idea or might not be very uh, pro to it we start off with uh, what we call the early adopters uh, these are the ones who are ready to jump on the ship quickly so they understand the idea they understand the concept we do the brainstorming with them we do the idea testing with them and then they actually go on into the market and start implementing it and then they start sharing their feedback and we have seen that quite a few times uh, we they come up with feedback that we could have not initially imagined so while drawing up a plan on paper and i always say this as drawing up a plan on paper is relatively much more easier but when you go on the ground and start implementing it new challenges start coming in new intricacies start cropping up so we have seen this happen with a lot of ideas that we have tried to implement and there have been cases where basis uh, the feedback from these early adopter franchises we actually shared the ideas but in certain cases where we get a good feedback where the franchises are pretty happy with the response they are getting then we then we make these franchises our brand ambassadors and then they try to reach out to the other franchise partners and try to educate them and also share their experience absolutely and i think uh, that's where you create your tribe you know and uh, and it's a, it's not a easy answer because uh, people are at different vintages in their businesses and 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 these days anyway the businesses have their own uh, you know challenges and and the last two three years i would i say that that is one of the most challenging times in corporate india and in these times to create a you know kind of a sustainable structure and also evolve a lot of people coming from a different background different Uh, financial and business pressures is a quite a bit of ask uh, unlike what we used to see in the in a more uh, you know uh, environments which were economically more stable so these are uh, very very challenging times and and in these times uh, arnab i mean i would like to understand that what i mean you would have a lot of uh, as you said early adopters people who who would have uh, you know ability to understand and evolve themselves and and cope up with the entire thing but a lot of people are out there sometimes which which are not able to do that i mean would you would you how do you handle that situation how do you handle uh, sometimes uh, uh, people who are not able to really get through that i mean is it relearning training uh, you know alliances or as you said i mean mentoring programs 
uh, what kind of uh, uh, structure now i mean you're looking at especially with with the covid around uh, what kind of uh, uh, you know strategy you have in mind to really help uh, your your a lot of uh, existing franchises so so i think for a young uh, startup which is into franchising uh, i feel nothing works better than peer to peer so for a for a more mature startup say like a mcdonalds or a subway they they would have their own sops and they would they have done this so many times that they have the systems and processes in place uh, for us i think uh, it it has been a learning process and to be very honest uh, we are still learning but till date what we have seen is that nothing works better than peer to peer so franchisees tend to respect another franchisee that has uh, shown a lot of success in the past uh, the best example is we have seen that a lot of our new new franchisees that come on board they typically reach out to our multi unit franchisees reason being that the multi unit franchisee has tried out the business model first with one unit and because of the success and because of the uh, response that he has got he has been able to reap profits and reinvest that profit into a second store uh, fortunately for us with you clean uh, despite being a startup which is just 3 years old uh, we have a, a franchise return rate of almost 20% where a franchisee after tasting success with a first unit has gone on to invest in a second or a third unit in fact we have at least four instances uh, today where a franchisee has more than three units in place so these these uh, multi unit franchisees obviously because they have gone on to invest in more than one unit uh, they are enjoying the business they share a good rapport with us uh, in fact i would say that there is a very uh, strong mental connect wherein if we pitch an idea to them even before we are able to explain the logic or the rationale behind these I- the idea these franchisees actually jump onto it because they themselves understand the logic behind it because they are doing it on the ground so for us i uh, the peer to peer has always worked the best while the idea is always very transparent we generally do a general body meeting kind of a arrangement uh, especially with covid 19 we are doing it over video calls where we invite all the franchise partners and present the idea to them but they, they later on we divide them into groups and allow the uh, more mature franchisees the franchisees that are early adopters and, and have been in the system for longer we allow them to educate we allow them to brainstorm with the newer franchisees sure over to you yeah great so you know this one thing i would uh, you know want to understand about um, you know the laundry industry as such so indian you know i was reading about it a bit which says that indian laundry service market is anticipated uh, to grow at a double digit uh, cagr in the next 4 years and uh, the market penetration for the organized sector is only 5% you know in comparison to the unorganized dobies that we see all around however uh, you know in the in the former sector it is anticipated uh, to witness growth in many coming years and uh, you know it's not just one service uh, the laundry service provides you provide wash and fold wash and iron dry cleaning and now you're you know getting a bit uh, you know extended in terms of going into their homes also to give them those services so want to understand two three things uh, you know with respect to all this that one what are the services that consumers uh, expect from you uh, in the sense that they prefer you know one over the other and how does it really vary uh, you know nationwide since you're a nationwide chain you've got uh, you know multiple outlets so is there any uh, any insight uh, onto that and how are you looking forward to tap uh, the areas where you're not here right now sure uh, so to answer your first question there are two services that i would call our bread and butter services one is uh, and both these services are done on a per kg basis so one is your wash and iron service and the second one is your wash and fold service so wash and iron is where you wash dry iron package it and then deliver it back to the customer in wash and fold uh, you do pretty much the same except the ironing part is missing now what we have seen is that uh, and uh, if you look at it logically it makes a lot of sense that when you go into student areas like we have an outlet bang in the middle of delhi university uh, we have an outlet right outside thapar university in patiala or pdpu university in gandhinagar in gujarat uh, or we also have a store uh, in uh, in bangalore which is right outside uh, vishveshwara university so in these pockets where you have a huge concentration of students uh, the wash and fold percentage is as high as 80 to 90% and oh. the reason for that is that uh, 
the students uh, you you would see that typically students of delhi university or similar universities they like to wear clothes that are crumpled that are disheveled but not necessarily dirty so that is why because that's how they become cool and uh, this is we are seeing this consistently across india so in in such pockets you would see that there is a very high uh, demand for a wash and fold service and typically people would not opt for a wash and iron service but as an example take uh, greater kailash to which is just uh, 10 kilometers from our delhi university store there the percentage of wash and iron is as high as 95% so the the two businesses actually tend to oscillate a lot depending on the kind of location there is also big seasonality element so when you when you are there in north india uh, the business takes a very sharp dive almost uh, 40 50% lesser sales are reported during the summer seasons because people tend to uh, move out for vacations and you will see this across north india whether it is jaipur chandigarh delhi our sales actually take a 40 50% hit during the summer seasons but just before the summer seasons which is when your winter is ending the sales hit a peak reason for that is because people start getting out their woolen wear and getting them packaged so literally from february to april it is almost impossible to manage the kind of load that our stores are getting but then again may june july are very tough because people start moving out for vacations and the sales take a sharp dive but in mumbai right now it is the peak because you are going through a very difficult monsoon seasons which is almost 3 to 4 months long so here we see that because you cannot technically dry your clothes in this kind of monsoon so we get a lot of demand for wash and dry services in some cases we actually get a lot of calls where people tell us that we have actually washed our clothes but the clothes are not getting dried so can you please dry the clothes for us so uh, there is a lot of seasonality from one part of the country to another part of the country Okay, great. That's interesting. And how about uh, you know your expansion plans uh, with respect to you know uh, the areas? I understand you've got about two hundred and fifty plus outlets. But what are your plans for now? Uh, looking out for territories and what kind of territories you're looking at? So one thing that has been very uh, heartening for us and uh, is the the way tier two and tier three cities have reacted. and i'll give you a very uh, interesting example so uh, we had launched a store in ranchi and then within a few months of la- launching that store we launched a second store i went for the inauguration of that particular store and after uh, the store inauguration the franchisee owner he took us to a nearby restaurant for lunch uh, there was a kitty party that was going on on a table in the inside the same restaurant where we saw that a couple of ladies were actually flaunting uclean bags <laughs> surprise for us because in tier 1 cities like delhi mumbai or bangalore we typically see that our bags are used for discarding of the house waste or at best they used to do vegetable purchase but i could have never imagined that uh, in a city like ranchi uh, this would become a status symbol so now what we are realizing is that whether you go to a guwahati you go to a shillong you go to a belgaum uh, uclean becomes a status symbol it's an aspirational brand and a uh, uh, lady manning her house would actually want to show it off to other ladies that her clothes are getting you clean and they are not getting clean at home so this is this is something which we had not anticipated initially but it was very heartening we always thought that uh, tier 2 and tier 3 would be more difficult given that i myself come from a tier 3 city like jamshedpur i thought that it would be more difficult to crack but if you look at our sales number for a city like jamshedpur today it is doing way better than a lot of other cities are doing so i think our focus going forward uh, is to concentrate more on these tier 2 and tier 3 cities in india uh, the demand that we are getting in terms of the franchising inquiries also clearly reflects that people in these cities want us to get there so whether it's a gorakhpur a balia whether it's a jamshedpur uh, dhanbad uh, we are getting a lot of demand and these are the cities that we are focusing on for at least the next one year apart from that uh, international markets or we are also getting a lot of direct inquiries so this franchisee that we have closed in nepal and is in fact our master franchisee he actually reached out to us after seeing our ads on facebook and met me in nepal and decided to sign up on the dotted lines uh, we are also getting a lot of inquiries from other sarc countries especially sri lanka and bangladesh so 2020s i would ideally want and this is what we are working towards is we would also want to have a presence in at least these two countries sure good good sounds sounds great and Uh, expanding in yeah. 
definitely uh, Arundhav has said, and I completely go with this. And this has been a it's not easy, you know. First, uh, to really have ambition to build something which is pan India uh, was a very, very uh, tough call because the adaptability, uh, diversity of this country culturally, uh, you know, religion, religion plays a very different. A lot of people don't like their clothes being washed with something else, and so on and so forth. So, a lot of these are challenging situations when franchise companies look at uh, doing, uh, you know, they are they are going on again. Uh, uh, you know, two different issues. One is the channel itself is very diverse uh, because everybody has a different upbringing, different culture and different structure and uh, different education, different financial backgrounds and so on. So forth. And on the other side, the customer is also very different, right? So India, it really offers you a very unique marketplace to do that. And, and I think uh, one of the areas which I th should compliment Arunab uh, because he himself has put, uh, and that's where I see a lot of uh, franchise companies miss out. Uh, because they, as an entrepreneur, they don't really invest in their own uh, improving their skill and their knowledge about markets. Because I don't know, uh, last three years I've been seeing that he himself has traveled almost all markets uh, and gone there, uh, presented, worked with the franchisees, uh, and worked on that. So that that knowledge is to me very special uh, because that would be not available with a lot of franchises. I would know. I can easily say that, but 95% of franchises. Would, would know about their home market, but they would not know other markets. So their 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 ability to understand and adopt to a, a very diverse uh, marketplaces becomes very difficult. And this is one of the areas where the older companies would, uh, the, the mature companies would always do. I remember when we had discussion with Yum. Uh, uh, Yum is the most mature uh, franchise organization. Uh, obviously, they run brands like KFC, Pizza Hut, uh, Taco Bell, and so on and so forth. So every single market, wherever they want to do real time, they would run a lead time of at least a year or two years uh, to understand that market very well. And still they do mistakes. I mean, if you look at, look at it, the KFC entering India had a, was a very big disaster. Pizza had failed in multiple markets. Taco Bell, uh, they took at least two years to learn what is the right way to do that. Actually, uh, Taco Bell, they started Bangalore and the ba Bangalore outlet failed uh, miserably before they did a re -avtar. To launch their entire thing. So even these companies with such a kind of a learning background that they can still go wrong in, in some sense. Uh, so it is it is not a one easy task. Uh, and uh, and Arnam, now you're going international. Uh, and uh, what is your what is your larger international strategy while well, Nepal happened because that was still a natural market. But I feel you have much bigger market uh, available now in say larger Middle East, uh, Africa, Central Asia, even Southeast Asia is still, I mean, some part of Southeast Asia is still very open and I think. Is there a particular strategy or is it a now or what is next three years for or four years for you clean as a group? What what do you really want to do? Sure. So, uh, certain markets that of, are of a lot of interest to us, these international markets like the MENA region is something that we are uh, working on uh, with a lot of right earnest and sincerity. So, like you said, MENA region is, uh, like you said, with uh, Taco Bell or with Pizza Hut. Uh, we have been studying these markets for the last six, seven months. And uh, we have just started talking to prospects in uh, uh, in areas like Qatar, Oman, and uh, UAE. The idea is that we feel that uh, MENA in particular uh, is a great market because while there are certain laundry players that are there, but the penetration is not good enough. So if you look at even uh, UAE, you have players that are doing very well in UAE but they have, for whatever reasons, they have not taken a call on expanding to other parts of the GCC region. Or if you talk about uh, North Africa, and again, there is a very interesting validation. There was a company that was uh, trying to pretend that it's uh, Ucleans subsidiary in uh, Africa was act has actually awarded a couple of franchisees in Kenya and Nigeria. So in, in that sense, uh, proof of concept, while not not the ideal the, not the kind of proof of concept that we would have ideally wanted actually exists in africa and so another interesting market that we are targeting is africa in particular kenya nigeria zimbabwe and south africa where we feel that the demand is there we have a lot of data that actually shows that a laundry industry is almost growing exponentially in these parts of africa so these are certain other markets that we are very keen on and these are certain markets that we are already in active conversations with. So idea would be that by the end of 2021, we would want to have a very solid presence in the MENA region, but at the same time cover a couple of other South countries, which are very easy to manage even sitting from India. 
Sure. And before we go to the next, I would like to take one question, which is I think Mr. Chokawala has asked uh, uh, has, uh, that this is a shift market you've gone into and, and a lot of franchise brands when they start and I'm, I'm putting these questions because uh, they don't have a compelling reason why customer would shift because we, we have to all understand that in almost all categories, uh, customer is using something somewhere uh, already, which means that people were still washing clothes, they were still drying clothes and so on and so forth. Whenever we design that opportunity, while we all talk about the growth of that industry and so on and so forth, but how do we really understand what is the compelling reason for people to shift, right? So, uh, and and I would like you to answer that while, uh, you know, we've seen, in, and this is something where I would always advise a lot of uh, franchise brands also go wrong because they, they, they create their own product, but they don't understand what is the compelling reason in my business model, why would people shift? So Arnab, if you want to ask a reply for, for Mr. Jokawala's question in terms of what is what is the big compelling reason why customers would shift? I mean, there are some obvious ones, but I mean, looking at India as being a price conscious market and things of that nature, he's asking price, uh, you know, loyalty towards their, I mean, whatever Dhobi is or other uh, conventional ways of uh, uh, doing that. What is a big shift opportunity in your case? Sure. So I think uh, this, is, uh, this is a question that we faced uh, when we were just thinking about launching UK. And this is the question that we are facing even when we have uh, 250 plus uh, franchisees on board. And I think this is a question that we face almost with even the franchisees that sign up and eventually launch a store. This is the first question that comes to their mind as well, is that laundry is already happening at home. Laundry is happening. Maids are doing the laundry. You have the best possible washing machines that are doing the laundry for you. But I think the, the biggest uh, single biggest driving factor, if I can pinpoint it, is convenience. So I think the biggest reason why people want to outsource their laundry to Uclean or to say any, any other laundromat is because of the convenience that we offer. Price points, uh, because of the kind of business that we are in, we are actually able to match the price points that uh, or match the amount of money that you're spending at home by uh, employing a maid and getting your laundry done. So if you look at the unit economics and I'm not getting into it right now, but I could maybe do it one-on-one -on -one for Mr. Jokawala is that uh, the amount of money that you're spending getting your laundry done at home, you can actually get your laundry done at, uh, done at a UP in an outsourced manner and still end up spending the same amount of money. But, but then you then eventually you invest because I feel that human resource would never be able to match an automation machine, right? Machine would create a better throughput. And eventually India would continue to see manpower becoming more and more expensive. I mean, there is no answer to it. And that's where the biggest threat for large nations like India is uh, because the automation in everything would replace people. And if that happens in a country as large as India, you know, you will have obviously a lot of people not having a job. But, but from a business economics viewpoint, uh, I think uh, uh, the throughput of a machine would always be much better and, uh, you know, more effective from a pricing viewpoint than a human doing it, right? So, I mean, a person who can spend all day, 10 hours, uh, really washing clothes and with not the best quality machine would do maybe in one hour. So I, I, I think it's, it's a clearly an automation uh, business and this we have seen in almost all industries. Uh, wherever the automation was done, uh, it created better efficiency, it created better service and it created obviously better price. Uh, and that's something which is, which is very natural on, on any, any other thing uh, which, is, which is where the world would need, need to go. Another question from you, Ashita. Yeah, so, uh, you know, having said that, we're talking about the customers. I wanted to understand, you know, it's a, uh, it would have been the first question that I would have asked, but how has uh, COVID impacted your business? I mean, how in terms of customers, you know, what, what the expectation from him has changed from you as a brand? And has it any, has it changed anything for you? So, so, uh... One very interesting thing that has happened and uh, since the lockdown has been removed is that a lot of our stores across India are notice, uh, notice, noticing and reporting a huge influx of new customers. So customers that say about six months back were uh, using the services of the local Dhobi and primarily because they had a generational relationship with the local Dhobi where typically the local Dhobi's father served your father and now the local Dhobi is serving you. So you do not want to break that relationship. It is almost a family relationship built on trust, built on a long uh, experience of service. 
And typically, even if you realize that there is a U clean or an organized laundry store nearby that is offering a better service, you would still not have the heart to say no to your local dhobi. But now what we have seen is that a lot of these customers that were customers of local dhobi, they're suddenly migrating to U clean and migrating in hopes. Reason for that is that all of a sudden hygiene and safety has become paramount. So now they want to know where the clothes are getting washed. Now they want to know how are they getting washed? What are the kind of chemicals that you're using? What is the kind of machine that you're using? And these are questions that a local dhobi doesn't have answer to because he doesn't have the access to the machinery, the right kind of chemicals or the right kind of technology or training for that matter. So this is a very uh, strong movement that we're observing. And this is being reported right from Shillong in Northeast to uh, Bangalore in South or even to uh, Dehradun in uh, Upper North. We are seeing this across India. So a lot of these customers uh, now are for the first time we are witnessing what I call a loyalty shift happening in the laundry industry and predominantly happening because of the impact of the COVID crisis. While the sales are increasing, and I would say in majority of the cases, the sales are still not close to what they were about four or five months back. But because our businesses anyway are uh, OPEX light, so the, the stores are typically neighborhood stores, rentals are lower, you can actually run the entire business with just two manpower. So the salary expense is not very high. So as a result of which, while we are not still not where we would ideally want to be, but at least most of the stores are at a level where they are able to break even. Okay. So what is the typically investment that goes in considering, you know, from a tier three city to tier one city, I'm sure the investment would vary, but what is it from minimum to maximum uh, from a franchisee point of view that he needs to invest? Uh, so for a starter, you start off with... Uh, what we, what we call the starter kit. So you have one laundry machine and you have one steam iron table and you're able to set up an entire store which includes our franchise fee, the cost of fabricating of the store and the equipment and machinery about in about 13 to 14 lakhs. Okay. Okay. And you know, how do you, um, uh, I don't know, when it comes to uh, customer service, uh, you know, there's a uh, there's a uh, typical saying that, uh, you know, customer is the king when it comes to, you know, any kind of a retail or a service-based business. So how do you manage that, uh, you know, or how do, what do you do to make that culture sustain from you down the line to your partners in terms of servicing a consumer? Sure. So I think while it's, it's, it's cliche to say, but we are really obsessed about customer delight. And... Fortunately for us, uh, we have been able to, in 95% of the cases, find franchise partners who are really obsessed about customer delight. And uh, this is one question that we always ask during our prospect discussion is how keen are you about ensuring that your customer is always happy? And wherever we feel that if that is one point where the deal can potentially break, we have actually walked off from a couple of deals in the past where we have realized that uh, the the person willing, looking to invest in the franchisee does not have a good customer delight history in the past or does not look too, too excited about managing customers. So honestly, while uh, we love to partners and we don't have too many criteria when it comes to partnering with prospective franchisees, customer delight is the only deal breaker in our case. So we are pretty obsessed about it. And uh, fortunately for us, we have been able to recruit a lot of fantastic franchise partners and uh, uh, you can actually see it when you go online. Uh, Uclean enjoys a Google rating of 4.4 on a scale of 5. But when you go to the overall laundry industry, when you look at other organized and unorganized player, you would see that the rating typically tends to hover between 3.5 to 3.6 to 3.7. So I, I think in that's the case, uh, a lot of credit to our franchise partners who have been very obsessed about delighting the customers. Personally, I also uh, spend a lot of time on uh, customer delight. So we have a customer delight ID. Uh, I am I'm the only person who has the access to it because if there is any escalation that happens, it generally comes on that delight ID. So I personally write back to the customer and, and make sure that the problem is resolved in case it's a genuine problem, it's resolved as soon as possible. And I also manage personally the WhatsApp customer care chat. So that is also one thing that I solely manage. I have access to it. And I make sure that all queries that are being raised, especially with respect to customer escalation, they are responded to and resolved within an hour. 
Oh, that's interesting. You know, you remind me of uh, Annie Hathaway in the movie The Intern. So the only happiness she got from was to make sure that the clothes reaches, uh, you know, people in time. Yeah. So no, that's that's a brilliant thought. I think uh, you know that's that's something that takes you a long way. Uh, that's something which is very interesting. Another important thing, uh, you know, for an organization is uh, I don't know. You know, I completely love this line from uh, Robert Phillips. You know, he says strategy without process is nothing more than a wish list. So w- what is it, uh, you know, that has helped you reach where you are today, and what is it that you would, uh, you know, it would take you to go from here to there? So I think uh, the biggest answer to that is the team. Uh, we have been very fortunate that uh, the team that started off Uclean, and there were about uh, four of us initially, and then within the first uh, three months, there were about uh, eight of us. That eight, which I call the core team, that is still there. That is still very much there. They have actually grown on to take on larger roles, but at the same time, made sure that they remain connected to what they were initially doing. So I think, uh, for especially for UK, the fact that we picked up people from the grassroots. So we, when we started off, uh, because of uh, paucity of funds and because of uh, my prior experience, we consciously decided to uh, leave pedigree on the side and look at people who actually worked on the ground, given the nature of the business that we have. So we handpicked people from the laundry industry. In fact, one of my, uh, I would call him a co-founder. He actually comes from the uh, laundry industry. His parents uh, still own a couple of ironing shops in an area called Rohini in Delhi, and they are very passionate. They still do about 200 pieces uh, ironing on a per day basis. So he started off. He came in as the first team member, and he is still very much there. The second, third person, they are also from the laundry industry. They have a laundry background, but all of these, they were very young. Uh, they while they want, they love laundry industry. They wanted to be in the laundry industry. They wanted to do something bigger, so I think that is one reason why they have been able to drive you clean to where we are today. And I think this core team would continue to be the reason why we'd be able to drive growth going forward as well. But at the same time, uh, the technology that we have in place has also evolved a lot. So today, the amount of information that we have in place, whether it it's uh, it, whether it with respect to something as simple as uh, Indian women love to wear polka dot skirts. So this is a major finding that we have from the use of technology in the last two and a half years, where our software actually allows the franchisee or the store manager to even register the type of cloth that he is washing. So this is one very interesting insight that we have found in the last two years that Indian women, uh, when when it comes to skirts, Indian women tend to love polka dots. So a lot of such information is coming through because of more extensive use of technology, and this would be one of the bigger contributors. As we move towards the next five years of UT, great. That's an interesting insight. And because we're coming to the you know end of this, I should really uh, uh, ask you uh, you know I don't know because fundamentally what I'm seeing is that there is a I'm not talking more from an industry viewpoint, and you you've been very very active in the franchise industry, and we're seeing a, a lot of uh, new franchise uh, brands which are coming out in the market, and this is very natural when the when you know there is a changes in the way consumer behaves uh, new ideas would emerge and franchising obviously is a delight for a lot of people who have great idea but don't have that kind of capital uh, so franchising becomes a way to uh, go faster in the market penetrate more get your market share and so forth and i know also on your on your uh, uh, you know both at the group level and also on your personal capacity you are you are now investing into new startup ideas which is very good because i always see that you know the ecosystem you know if you see what happened in flipkart uh bunsels made some success in e-commerce and then they went and invested into multiple other so and which helps from more from a strategic view point because uh, you actually tell the other person don't do the same mistakes i did right don't do the same thing which i entirely it's not no, more sort of times telling what is right but telling what is not right you know so it's a it is a very important aspect i, I have realized in, in in especially so you're doing a lot of uh, Uh, companies any particular sectors you are more excited about or any particular areas and if you are also want to give a uh, maybe a little profile and help uh, to our audience to understand uh, what kind of a uh, you know uh, few things you should look at if you getting into franchise or or i mean uh, anything which you would like to share for especially when the companies which you are looking at and i know you are inviting a lot of interest these days for 
a uh, lot of people are reaching out to you for for you being partner of uh, any franchise startup any feedback on that uh, so i think uh, uh, especially with the kind of impact that covid is having and given that that this impact is going to be long term regardless of when and how we discover a vaccine for uh, the covid 19 so i think that there are certain sectors that are uh, now going to become the franchising favorites replacing the traditional franchising favorites like the food industry or the salon industry and there are certain industries that i feel are uh, really uh, slated to grow very quickly almost exponentially and one sector that i am hugely betting on is health tech uh, so there i have already uh, partnered with one of my classmates and uh, we have launched this uh, brand of cloud clinics powered by artificial intelligence called remesis and the idea is that uh, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to blend traditional healthcare with telemedicine because i very strongly feel that you cannot 100% replace traditional healthcare nor can you make uh, telemedicine the 100% favorite it has to be a very healthy blend a very conscious blend between the two so we have uh, launched these uh, clinics these are physical brick and mortar clinics which are managed by a highly trained nurse but the doctor remains virtual so the the patient actually talks to the nurse physically she can be sitting right next to the nurse where the nurse can do the initial diagnosis and then she connects the patient directly to the doctor who is remotely located say somewhere even in the united states so i very strongly feel that health tech and innovations in health tech and healthcare would be the one that would become long term they would be sustainable they they would be also highly franchisable because the moment you big bring technology it becomes very easy to replicate a, a model from one place to another from one neighborhood to another one country to another so that is one sector that i am very bullish on and would love to partner with more startups another very interesting space that i feel would grow because of the increased concern for cleanliness is the circular economy space so all the recycling startups where there has to be a technology intervention recycling has been happening for uh, for a very long time in india there are still a lot of challenges there are still a lot of this the technology is still pretty much obsolete but i feel that if the right technology can be introduced and the right business model can be introduced then this model is again also highly franchisable uh, something like a hub and spoke model where you have these uh, very advanced plants with all the right technology right machinery and then you have collection centers across a particular city which keep feeding into these larger plants so i think personally uh, health tech uh, and recycling or the circular economy spaces are two sectors that really excite me where i would love to invest love to participate then there is obviously the edtech space while everybody is talking about edtech and a lot of new models and new formats are coming in but i feel that the formats that are again having a high technology penetration have a high tech angle would be the ones that would be easier to scale through the franchising route sure and i also feel that that's way because the consumption uh we have to look at from the consumption side you know sometimes we we just follow uh, what others have done in the market and these are very unique times we are all living in uh, not necessarily talking about what is happening through covid and other things but i think the consumption is changing faster than you know and the competition which is coming in is most of the time invisible you know so it's not coming from a conventional structure so when you were say in education you never thought technology would become your competition because technology was enabler but now with all that is happening and when this is what you said is right um, uh, education i think would get start online education would start getting recognition and once that started it would disrupt the infrastructure you would deploy you know the, there would no need to, left for a lot of these uh, you know uh, physical infrastructures you know which we were all conventionally been in that thing this has not happened in hundreds of years and uh, and now suddenly it start disrupting so a lot of these uh you know opportunities would emerge and it will see a big uh, growth in the franchising side and obviously experience like yours uh, which understands uh, technology understands new age consumer behavior i think would create a big complement to a lot of these new franchise startups yeah so uh, you know there's one question uh, you know that ramesh is uh, asking that you know certainly you see a shift from uh, an organized to organized sector but do you see also a shift from people who were kind of you know washing or drying their clothes themselves uh, who are sending it to you you know maybe nuclear families or the others what is the percentage of that and do you see that growing yeah absolutely so 
uh, I think, like I said before, the single biggest driver has become convenience is becoming the single biggest drivers. Your manpower has become expense becoming expensive. Manpower has become erratic, and I, of, out of all household chores, I think uh, washing clothes is the one that is most taxing because it takes a lot of your time. Uh, when you especially talk about nuclear families, typically uh, offices today require people to work five six days every week, so you only get your Sunday free. If you end up uh, getting your clothes washed on that particular Sunday. the washing of clothes itself takes about one and a half to two hours so you actually end up spending two hours of your precious time which you could have rather spent on say watching a movie or going out to a restaurant or catching up with friends so this is the reason why i feel especially with uh, nuclear families where you don't have your grandparents or your parents to support you the these are the kind of people that actually tend to outsource their laundry even more than ever and i think this number is only going to increase people are going to become busier people are going to become too occupied with their lives the amount of time that you get which we call the me time would also get reduced you would not want to end up spending that me time on a menial chore like laundry true true that's an interesting thing so i don't know overall you know in ukraine i only see one problem for which i need an answer from you is water it's going to get scarce uh, you know in times to come so what is it that you're doing uh, to overcome that problem Sure. So I think uh, the an alternate way to look at it, and you would see that this is happening in a, in a lot of societies in Mumbai, especially the ones that are coming up in new cup parade and these newer areas, is that uh, the society, by conscious, is taking a decision to uh, stop allowing people to do their laundry at home, because uh, if you look at it, especially the newer apartments that are coming up in Mumbai and in some parts of Pune. they deliberately don't have that washing area the typically small area that you used to have in your apartment where you used to keep your washing machine they're doing away with that area and they are openly advocating that the residents should outsource their laundry to a laundry player in fact a lot of them uh, have partnered with us and we are setting up in house laundry in such societies uh, there is one that is coming up in uh, amdavad called the banyan and this is one of the most expensive uh, real estate project ever in the history of amdavad where they just have a, a 20 floor of uh, apartment and each floor is one person so each floor is being sold out to a single family they have given us a massive 1000 square feet space right at the bottom of that particular society where we are setting up you clean laundry and they are charging the uh, families a certain amount every month for getting their laundry done so it is a mandate that you cannot get your laundry done inside your home you need to outsource it to a you clean which has been specially set up for your convenience beneath your housing society so these are uh, and this makes a lot of sense because the moment five families they are washing their independent clothes independently at home all these five families clothes could be clubbed together and washed in one cycle at you clean so we could actually end up saving 75% to 80% water that is now being spent because these families are washing their clothes individually so i think uh, uh, going forward this is going to actually become the norm the laundromats would be there they would need water but they would actually reduce the water consumption on washing of clothes by almost 75 to 80% because community laundry can be done true true no that's a huge thing and that's uh, probably you know one of the stg goals today as well correct and this is a answer which you given more on the luxury side but i think the demand on the on the you know uh, uh, more value based housing is even greater because they don't have the infrastructure you know luxury still has a infrastructure available people available and things like that imagine if you are in a let's say a, a co living kind of environment where youngsters live in and, and things like that they don't have any any sport functions so, and uh, most of the laundromats are actually rushed by a lot of uh, young people people who work in uh, you know singly they have to go to office every single day they don't have time so they every third day they would go to the nearest laundromat and just drop their clothes and pick up them either the same evening and they all very well dry uh, washed and and ironed and and that makes a huge amount of convenience for this and in india is young people you know is a for 300 million people who are less than 25 so you are in a right time right market sure yeah true so you know as we are uh, running through the you know closing of the webinar on a lighter note just wanted to understand that uh, uh, is it easy to work uh, in the office with your better half 
or it's easier without your better half in the office? Since I understand you and Gunjan work together. So, that's a tricky one. <laughs> we are live. <laughs> that's the, that's a challenge. So I think uh, I think it has to be a healthy mix. Probably question should have been asked to Gunjan rather than you. I think. <laughs> having a bigger problem than you are <laughs> I, I think it's a healthy, it's a healthy mix we consciously uh, ensure that we are not together working inside the same space for more than three to four hours three to four hours is manageable it starts becoming difficult after that <laughs> to each other the good part with you and uh, gunjan is that you are both have very strong professional and very clearly uh, over expertise is also very different and if you stay away from commenting on each other's core expertise, then I think it makes more sense. Otherwise, it can be a, a problem. Correct. But I, 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 if I, because I know both of you, you complement each other very well. And there is no, uh, uh, you know, better than uh, having your, as a team member, as your, as your uh, better half. And, and, and if you work as a team and, and the kind of value you can bring in uh, is much, much greater. I think uh, that's something which we also seeing a big trend in franchising. So as couples, they come and they take uh, franchise opportunities and they're very, very good at uh, uh, delivering that and that uh, creates much more harmony, I, I personally think. Sure. Yeah, true. And, uh, you know, having said that, uh, what do you do apart from, I understand that you're, you know, mentoring startups and, uh, you know, you're taking care of Uclean also and you, uh, you know, uh, take care and you you being in touch with your uh, alumni of uh, you know your uh, you know current uh, classmates or your juniors as well apart from this what do you do to refresh or reboot yourself so i i, I love road trips and the yeah. first opportunity i got was like for example this sunday we had a launch happening in jaipur and while the franchisee did not formally extend us an invitation we still decided to go and be there as part of the launch because I really love the road trip part of going to say a Jaipur or a Dehradun or a Shimla. So that is also one reason why I make sure that I attend almost every launches that is happening in any part of the country, especially when you can actually reach there by road. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So you drive yourself? No, I actually don't drive myself. I <laughs> Uber or I have, I have someone else drive it. And that's oh, yeah. the advantage of having uh, three co-founders, of who, all of who can drive, including women. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, that's a good thing to uh, look at. That's interesting. No, I think it is lovely, um, Aranav, talking to you. I think you're one of those, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are very aspiring. And I think it's it's a lot of, I can capture everything in this one hour. I think, uh, you know, you've got a lot to offer to new people who come on board and particularly, you know, who are into franchising. There's a lot to learn. Uh, from you. So thank you so much uh, for being on the platform. I would just ask uh, you and uh, Gaurav sir to say a last uh, word or anything that you want to comment on, uh, you know, particularly in franchising, anything is, as a best, best practice or one word uh, for franchising uh, that comes from your heart. So I think uh, franchising uh, is one of the best ways to grow a brand. And uh, I'm seeing this happening with a lot of uh, so-called online startups which were pretty much online and that all always said that they would continue to remain online and they would continue to remain absolutely asset light a lot of them and rightly so are migrating to franchising and that is where your o2o trend is happening online to offline is happening and uh, i feel this is good for uh, the overall ecosystem not only for the franchisees in particular the good thing is that a franchisee today has many more options to choose from uh, three years back, if somebody wanted to also be a part of, say, a brand like Urban Ladder or a Pepper Fry, he would not have an opportunity to participate because these are predominantly or these were predominantly online startups and uh, they used to sell their uh, furnitures online. But they also have very quickly realized that uh, they also need to go offline because customers want to have a touch and feel of the product before they want to buy it. And they've also realized that the best way to go offline is to have a franchisee format. So I think because of this realization and a lot of startups very rightly so are realizing this, uh, that offline has to be there, the touch and feel has to be there while it can be tech driven, but the touch and feel has to be there and the best way to go offline is to franchise. So I think uh, everybody's moving in the right direction and franchising should continue to grow and rightly so. 
Excellent.